What's better than getting a chance to tap the minds of the top leading experts on money in the markets like Jim Rickards, Danielle DiMartino Booth, John Nigerian, and Russell Gray? Being able to tap them all at once. By a show of hands, who thinks that the major world central banks will move to issue uh, each issue a CBDC or central bank digital currency within the next decade? Oh, decade? Next oh. month. Yeah, okay. all right, all right. <laughs> as fast so. as they can. Welcome to Wealthion. I'm Adam Taggart, founder of Wealthion, welcoming you back for another week of making sense of money and the markets so that you can make better informed decisions about building your wealth. Now, recently, I had the pleasure of hosting a panel on the future of money at the New Orleans Investment Conference, and it had an absolute killer lineup. Jim Rickards, Danielle DiMartino Booth, John Nigerian, and Russell Gray. As expected, the level of financial expertise and just the sheer neural power that ensued was off the charts amazing. So I begged Brian London and his team, the folks who produced the conference, to allow me to share a replay of the panel here with you on Wealthion, both so that you can benefit from its insights, as well as to see the extremely high caliber of idea exchange that happens amongst the fantastic experts at this event. Maybe you'll want to join me there next year. All right, enough talk. Let's get straight to watching the panel. The New Orleans Conference, the world's greatest investment event. Hi, everybody. Uh, I am Adam Taggart, uh, here to welcome you to the next panel that we have going on today. Um, this is a phenomenal panel, folks. Uh, for a living, I'm fortunate enough to run an interview series where I get to have in-depth conversation with some of the top experts in money in the markets, uh, but rarely do I get to speak to so many big thinkers at once. So this is a rare privilege. I feel a little bit like a kid in a candy store, um, but it should be a lot of fun, and I hope you guys enjoy it as much as I'm sure I'm going to. Um, very quickly, uh, let me just introduce today's panel. Um, we have Danielle DiMartino Booth. She is the CEO and Chief Strategist for Quill Intelligence. Uh, she's a former advisor to the Federal Reserve Board of Dallas, uh, Bank of Dallas, and she is the author of the excellent book on the Fed called Fed Up. Uh, Danielle, come on and join the stage. Let's have a little applause for her. Thank you. Uh, next, we have Jim Rickards. Jim is editor of the Strategic Intelligence Newsletter. He's author of several New York Times bestselling books, including The Death of Money and Currency Wars. Uh, he's an advisor to the Department of Defense and the US Intelligence Services. Uh, the list of his accomplishments goes on a lot longer. I just don't have enough time. But Jim, thanks so much for joining us. Next, we have John Nigerian. John is founder of the Market Rebellion website. He's co-host of Halftime Report and Fast Money on CNBC. And he is a former Chicago Bears linebacker, as well as a former options trader at the Chicago Board Options Exchange. Welcome, John. Thank you. Thank you. And last but not least, we have Russ Gray. Russ is co-founder of The Real Estate Guys, the leading real estate investing educational media company. And he's author of the book, Equity Happens. Right. Russ, come on up. Okay. All right, so the title of this panel is Gold, Crypto, and Cash, the Future of Money panel. So we're really gonna try to stay on the money side of things. Um, guys, a little context, and then we can jump right in. Um, I can see you all pretty well, but uh, I'd like to make this as interactive as possible. So if one of your colleagues is speaking and you have something that you'd like to say in reaction to what they're saying, just chime on in, maybe raise your hand so I can, I can get a call on you. Um, and uh, I really just want this to be as, uh, as much of a dialogue between you as it is me pitching you guys questions. Uh, but a little bit of context before we start. Uh, the old saying goes, buy land. They're not making any more of it. Well, you know what they are making a lot more of? Fiat currency. Over 10 trillion 
dollars or so worth of central bank balance sheet expansion has occurred since the onset of the COVID-19 pandemic. That's an increase of over 50% in less than two years. A growing number of analysts see the central banks as stuck in a trap of their own making. Having enabled debt expansion to levels never seen before in history, the cost of servicing that debt, as well as the systemic instability resulting from so many institutions with over leveraged capital structures, interest rates can't rise much without crashing everything. Luke Groman of research firm Forest for the Trees um, likens their predicament, the central bank's predicament, to Andy Dufresne's line from the Shawshank Redemption. They quote, better get busy inflating or get busy defaulting. <laughs> now, understanding that there may be surprising twists and turn along the way, panelists, I'm curious if you agree that inflation is the predictable ultimate endgame here for the world's major fiat currencies. Why don't we start with you, Jim? Uh, no, I don't agree. It's, it's not predictable. And the reason is uh, money supply is irrelevant to inflation. I know that's uh, um, uh, sort of like an apostate view for the uh, Aust Austrians and uh, monetarists in the audience, and I have a lot of respect for all the work that's been done in that field uh, from Erwin Fisher onward, but it, uh, it's not the determining factor. Uh, the determining factor uh, relating money supply to inflation is velocity, which is the turnover of money. That is a psychological phenomenon, behavioral phenomenon, which the Fed cannot control. The Fed can control M0. They can stick the landing. They can make that number whatever they want, and they have. Um, I'm well aware of the growth that you're describing, but um, Velocity, uh, and just to give a simple example, uh, you know, if I'm feeling good, if I'm feeling prosperous, if prospects are good and I want to go out to dinner and take my friends and drinks on me, uh, that's one state of the world. And I tip the waiter and the waiter goes home and takes an Uber and tips the Uber driver and the Uber driver puts gas in his car. Well, in that example, my money has velocity of three. One dollar uh, I start with is, produces three dollars of goods and services. Um, but if I depressed or worried or more into precautionary savings and I stay home and watch TV, um, my money has velocity of zero. And I remind people that $7 trillion times zero is zero, at least where I went to school. So, uh, the, so the point is, velocity is the driver, it's psychological, the Fed can't control it. Uh, I always say it's a sad day when a central bank wants inflation and can't get it, but they, they can't get it, they've forgotten how. I could, I could remind them, but they don't know how themselves. Okay. so. Uh Velocity, key essential element there. Danielle. Uh, velocity is the only essential element. <laughs> and actually, if you look at money supply growth and people forget that there is a different delta in this world, but if you look at the delta of money supply itself, we're on the cusp of it turning negative. In addition to money velocity, as Jim says, being as low as it is, uh, your fiscal impulse has also turned into a contractionary force and the Fed is stuck between a rock and a hard place. They will either make a policy error or they will make a policy error, to Luke Grumman's point. <laughs> so they really don't have a choice right now because of the inflation that 43.2% of, of US GDP being injected directly into the veins of US households checking accounts has caused. Now, I've just come back from two weeks in Europe, my first time abroad in, in five years, and I can tell you that the rest of the world right now is extraordinarily resentful of the level of fiscal stimulus that was pumped into the world economy because it's caused inflation, not just here in the United States, which will be transitory in the end, and we're also all dead in the end, um, but, but demand is slowing appreciably right now and people are not seeing it uh, because there's still so much flushness out there. But I can tell you that inflation has become very problematic in the medium term and it is something that has emanated from US fiscal policy double barreling with monetary policy policy right right um all right so jim i want to go back to you just for a second so uh you know the conclusions of your book the death of money um uh seems like you believe that the purchasing power of fiat currencies in the long run is going to continue heading downwards i don't want to put words in your mouth but Sure. Yeah. Can, uh, that, you, that, can you balance that with your comments about velocity? Yeah, that's right. One, one of the uh, frustrations in you know, speaking or writing, whatever, is um, uh, you know, the intertemporal effects. And I was, right now, I agree with Danielle that uh, inflation, as we see it, there are base effects, there are supply chain effects. It's transitory. We're going to tip fairly quickly into disinflation and deflation. However, if you go out two years, 
we're absolutely going to have inflation. So it's difficult. People say, oh, make a remind. No, it's just we're going to have disinflation for now, maybe borderline deflation. We're going to have to be really careful about that. We might have a global recession in 2022. I mean, the latest Atlanta Fed GDP projection is two-tenths of 1% growth for the third quarter. Um, by the way, that's down from 6.3 earlier in the quarter. So that... And also, so that, known, also known as a rounding error. Yeah, exactly. So that way, right, yeah, when you, when you strip out the noise, that could be negative. So the U.S. could actually be in a recession. We'll find out next year, but we could be in a recession right now. Uh, and the rest of the world is not far behind. Japan's there. Europe is close. China, they lie about their numbers, but they're probably, uh, they've produced the worst growth since 2008. Uh, but that said, when you get into 2023, uh, beyond that, I would expect an inflationary world for reasons that have nothing to do with what we're talking about, but more demographically driven. Okay. And Adam? Yeah, just, go ahead, John. Just real quick, the, um, uh, on a long enough timeline, everything is transitory. This is uh, more or less a, uh, something I'm stealing from both Fight Club and Zero Hedge. Mm -hmm. um, Zero Hedge, of course, popular uh, uh, website, uh, he says, on a long enough timeline, all of our survival rates drop to zero. Um, and certainly on a long enough timeline, uh, inflation is going to be transitory on a long enough timeline. But I think we're going to see, just as Jim and Danielle have said, um, some pretty interesting inflation going forward. We're already seeing it right now in energy like crazy. Uh, coal is up uh, 300 percent, the price of coal. Um, U.S. production of coal is up 22 to 25 percent. And why is that? Because you can't just pull on one lever as far as energy without all of them running along with it. Right. So if you've got crude oil driving up ever since MBS stopped putting the gun to his head, uh, that's the head of Saudi Arabia, Mohammed bin Salman. As soon as he took the gun away from his head because he was threatening Putin and the rest of OPEC, as soon as he took that gun away, um, and we went from those negative hours for right. crude oil to now pushing towards $90 a barrel for crude. People are going to try to buy anything they can um, to supply the energy that they need. Natural gas in Europe is three or four oh. times what it is here. Mm -hmm. And Putin says, I'll give you all you want, but it's going to be a lot more money. Right. But um, and, and that's got, that and, inflation. And Putin, Putin's got his own supply chain issues right now. He'd actually like to be selling more, which is kind of ironic. Yeah. Um, but but he's having a hard time moving as much as he can. I'll, I'll add I'll add a point. I'll add a, I'll add an ex exclamation point to what you're saying, John. And that's that our memories are very short. We forget the lead up to the 2008 Beijing Olympics, and the complete morass that that is causing because right now they have to clear the air around Beijing before February the 5th, 2022, when the Olympics starts. And that's what's exacerbating so much right now what's going on, especially with coal, is they've had to fire down all their coal production in and around Beijing because they've got all these ne international networks coming to broadcast and they can't broadcast in the smog. So this is really a massive outlier that is exacerbating an extraordinary situation right now for all forms of energy. I, six months ago, I told my friends to buy Australian wine because China declared a trade war on Australia because Australia spoke the truth about the Wuhan lab, lab being the source of the virus. Uh, so they said, no more Australian wine, and we're not buying any steel and all this stuff. Um, so it made the wine cheap. But China is on their knees begging Australia for coal right now. Yep. The whole thing has backfired, uh, and they can't get enough Daniels right. And because it's an illegitimate regime, you have to satisfy, you have to watch out for social disorder. So to the extent they have energy, they're diverting it to population centers and schools and cities and so forth, which means they're shutting down the industry. Right. Uh, and then, of course, that just exacerbates the supply chain issues, which we're all familiar with. So uh, China, like you say, could be in a recession, but China and Germany are going to freeze in the dark this winter. I mean, Merkel, did, she shut down all the nuclear, shut down all the coal-fired, um, solar and wind. Uh, I, I have the largest solar field in New England, non-commercial. I actually build it, uh, but it doesn't work at night. I'm, I'm sure of that. Uh, and, uh, so, uh, uh, and, and, and China is 71% coal. Correct. That's uh, what they consume. Right. So when they, and when they charge their electric vehicles in China, they're charging it with electricity from coal-fired plants. So thank you, Tesla, for increasing CO2 emissions. But that's the reality. Wow. All right. So we're changing this panel to energy and geopolitics. <laughs> um, no, that, that, that is fascinating. And, and um, you're, 
I, I want to stick in the short term for a second. Um, I, I think that the sort of the spirit of this panel was, hey, if we think in the long term, fiat currencies are going to be, you know, greatly devalued. Where should people put their money? And folks, I promise we'll get there in a moment. But I think one of the things this very august panel is is really highlighting here is that there's so many cross currents going on right now that the near term, by near term, I mean maybe sort of next two years, um, you know, it could be a really rocky ride. And there could be some things there that, that even though we have confidence in the long term ending, uh, we may see things happen that are very, very uh, oppositional to where we think things are going in the long run. So, Danielle, you talked about, uh, I think you used the term, the, the twin barrels of the shotgun. Um, but today we have markets at all time record highs, mm -hmm. right? And, uh, you know, you can definitely say that they got uh, a lot of help getting there from those twin barrels of monetary and sure. fiscal stimulus. It's, you know, I mean, the Fed's been helping the best it can since 2009, um, but it's gone into overdrive since the pandemic. And then Congress has stepped in with, with the trillions and trillions that it's, it's spent there. Um, so now we're looking at 2022. The Fed is talking a big game about tapering. So the monetary side looks like that barrel is going to be emptying. Uh, and Congress is having much, much harder time passing the fiscal stimulus side of things. That's and I've heard lynch, many, right? many analysts say that we are staring at the largest monetary and fiscal cliff at the same time in history. So, um, Jim, it sounds like you think that um, we are going to go into recession at some point, right? And this could I'm, be I'm not calling for that, but we're, we're way too close for comfort. And that could happen. OK, um, I guess just a quick, you know, quick poll of the panel here. What's the probability of this resulting in um, a material correction in the markets? And by material, I mean a 20 plus percent correction in asset prices uh, because of this uh, turning off of liquidity spigots. Well, let's hear from Russell, since you've been so quiet up there. <laughs> <laughs> what do you think? Put a probability on it, Russ. Do you, do you think we'll see a, a material correction in the next 12 to 18 months in the markets for that, that turning off of the liquidity? You're asking me. We are asking you. <laughs> Don't worry, I got plenty of questions here yeah, for you, Russ. I, I mean, worry. I'm a Main Street guy, you know, and so I, I hear about energy, and that means tenants are paying more money for gas. I heard gas was like seven bucks in, in California. In California, yeah. it's insane, right? And you know, when you're when you're living paycheck to paycheck, and you're sending 25 or 30 percent of your money to pay your rent, and then I look at the relationship between the the cost of that 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 income flow from rent into the bond market. And it's really the bond market that I want to talk with these guys about. You know that. Um, and, and, and what happened in, in 2008, where I didn't understand anything about all this, right? I'm not a top down guy. I kind of came from the street and I had to climb up to try to understand what was going on in the macro because all that rolled downhill and took out a lot of Main Street real estate investors. And it really wasn't a real estate crisis. It was a, it was a bond crisis, mortgage backed securities crisis and uh, all the leverage and and so and then that took the stock market with it right so to me one, the bond market one, is way bigger than the stock i'm not a stock market guy but i really pay attention to the bond market uh and i feel like the fed is trapped they can't raise interest rates uh, they have to find a way to create real negative interest rates i think and that's one of the things i want to talk about but if if for any reason you know the, the bond market falls apart it'll take everything with it yeah and, and so to me that's that's just what i focus on i you know i don't i don't invest in stocks i don't I, you know i think if i want to have equity i want equity in real things like property and gold and energy directly uh but the bond market affects everything in terms of the 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 uh, denomination or the valuation in dollars and and that's to me that that comes out of the bond market so yeah, okay. let them talk more I'll, than I'll me. Let folks answer, really what I'm trying to get now, is, 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 is do we do we see uh, if the Fed does deliver on its threats to taper? And Danielle, we had an interview earlier this week where you you said there's potential that the Fed, given inflation, may have to tighten. One, do we do we really feel that the Fed's actually going to go there? And if it did, can it tighten that much without just beginning to collapse everything because of how over leveraged the system is. No, I mean, I, I think right now, if you look at the at the 10s, 30s spread, um, that's been compressing pretty quickly. That that tells you that there's going to be pressure on the 10 year nominally um, because the economy is slowing. And at the same time, you've got the front end of the curve coming up, signaling that the Fed is going to be caught in a policy error and they're going to have to hurry up and taper and hurry up and hike rates. And that will be a massive policy error. But there's not going to be much that they can do once core PCE gets up and stays up 
And we're, we're seeing the flow through for the first time in this last CPI print, we saw 0.5% print on rental inflation. That's sticky. It's persistent. It's not transitory. It's not a supply chain issue. It's not Chinese. It's not energy. It's sticky. And it's 43% of the CPI. And leases are 12 or 18 months long. So the Fed has a real problem on its hand because it, so many people are employed and it looks like they're, they're throwing away their inflation mandate in favor of their labor mandate. Mm -hmm. And that's not going to work for very long. And that's why you're seeing, I mean, if there's anything that I'm following right now, it is how quickly the 530 on the yield curve is compressing. Just put it on your radar, make a note, watch the five year, 30 year spread. We've already crossed a milestone of 100 basis points this last week. And once you cross under that point, that starts to signal that we're heading towards inversion. The Fed won't have anything. They won't have tools in their toolbox to address an inverting yield curve if they also need to be tightening. So this is a real cluster mess. Yeah, <laughs> cluster mess. Sorry. I like that. Right, right at G for the audience. Thank you. <laughs> So the reason I'm kind of digging into this is if people don't have a lot of long-term confidence in the purchasing power of fiat currencies, the question that comes up is, well, is cash trash, right? Should I just be getting out of it as fast as possible? But from what you folks are saying, if I'm hearing correctly, there may be a period of time in the next 12 to 18 months where the markets contract, the dollar, the value of the dollar, strength of the dollar could potentially go you know, up by a lot Right, And so I guess the question I'm trying to get to with you guys is would people be better off not just racing to kind of get out of all their fiat currency today into something real, would it, would it be worthwhile at least keeping some dry powder around so that if it, it, there becomes a time where valuations are lower and more sane, cash is strengthened, you can be deploying that fiat currency at a better exchange rate and then moving more into assets that might survive the long course of what's ahead. Uh, John, let me ask you first. Um, well, I'm, as, as you guys may have guessed from the panel that, or from the d talk I had this morning, I'm a big supporter of uh, cryptocurrencies. And one of the reasons is that I see the pressures that you guys are talking about um, coming. Um, and I think this is a significant driver, privacy as well. I think are significant drivers for um, cryptocurrencies and out of fiat currencies. Um, and uh, in the back in the green room, we were talking about uh, you can get um, five percent on Bitcoin, twelve percent on Polkadot, all these different coins, uh, leaving them on various exchanges. They will pay you, give you part of that. Uh, lending process that they use to create markets because you have to be able to have longs and shorts in the markets. If you can only buy, uh, the market goes parabolic until it breaks and then it falls apart. Um, so you have to have people who are there to make markets and some of those people need to borrow to be able to do that. And so these cryptocurrencies like the ones I described or Solana or any of these, they'll pay you uh, 400%, 500%, 1200% more than you'll get in your bank account. And obviously there's a lot more demand on that side than there is for cash, for right. fiat. Uh, otherwise you'd be seeing rates a lot higher for fiat. Um, so I think right now, obviously the Fed has put its hand uh, really hard on rates, held them very low for too long, and uh, this is coming at a price. And eventually that price will be that, uh, uh, to Danielle's point, when they need to do something, they won't be able to do something because they won't be able to address inflation when they've got to worry about the inverting of that 10 That's year, right. 30 year. And there's no not QE coming down the pipeline right now. So the, the optionality that was there, I think, in 2019 is no longer there no longer for there. the Fed. So some of the tools in the toolbox, that's one of the reasons that they've been so aggressive in institutionalizing and formalizing things like the reverse repo facility, things like the standing repo facility, is that the Fed is concerned uh, that they're going to be out, out of ammunition at the wrong time. 
Um, I, I, I want to add something though here because it is somewhat anomalous when you talk about car sales being down for six months in a row. Um, that's what Cox Automotive is suggesting for the month of October. So six consecutive months of falling car sales in U.S. history is a 99.4 percentile uh, prop, uh, uh, pr percentile occurrence event. We we saw it in. February and in, sorry, sorry, in, in March and April of 2008 and in February of 2009. Those are the only three months in US history during the great financial crisis that we saw six back to back to back months. So why the hell is the stock market so high? Um, one thing that we have to bear in mind right now is that on February 19th, 2020, the US corporate bond market passed $10 trillion as a milestone. Now we're at about 11 and a half trillion. So you can't count out the power of all forms of liquidity, especially share buybacks that are being financed by debt. And that's right now one of the, one of the reasons that, had, that, that a lot of people, I think, are scratching their heads and saying, what's going on here? Um, you, you've got the Fed and corporate America um, really pump, pumping liquidity into the stock market. And that's one of the reasons that the bond market and the stock market are in such disagreement right now. Hmm. Great point. So, uh, Jim, let me just sort of ask you this, this let you respond to this last question, which is, um, you know, uh, is there an argument for keeping powder dry right now for this sort of <laughs> near term deflationary crunch or extreme disinflationary crunch, but where there could be a correction? And one thing I've heard other analysts talk about, and I'd love for you to just opine on it, which is they say, look, there, there's, there's, potential for a fairly large correction here, after which they think the Fed policy response is going to be stimulus at the scale that which we've never even yet seen to try to goose things back to life again. Do you share that view? Yeah, you, you should have a dry powder. The question is, where do you store it? Um, but I, I find forecasting Fed policy is the easiest thing I've ever done because they can be relied upon to, to blunder every time. Like just figure out the worst thing to do at the worst time, and, and that's, that's, what, they'll that's do. what they'll do. That, that's very true. But and um, <laughs> and uh, we're watching a movie we've seen before. So uh, see, here's what's going to happen because here's what did happen. 2000 March 2000. So May 2013, Bernanke <clears throat> announces the taper. He didn't use the word, but he implied that. November uh, 2013, they start the taper. Um, November 2014, they finished the taper. No more net uh, purchases. Uh, and then we get ready for the liftoff. March 2015, Yellen removes the word patient from the statement, that's your clue, that's your magic word, yeah. you know, they're gonna raise rates. But they didn't raise rates, <clears throat> pardon me, until December 2015. It took that long to raise rates, but they did. And the next uh, 25 basis point increase was December 2016. At that point, they got a little mojo and then they kept raising rates. Jay Powell comes in, uh, he raises them throughout Trump the, became president, two, so he expedited the two, tightening. Right, 2018, and you're up to two and a quarter. What happens next? From October 1st to December 24th, 2018, the stock market fell 20%. In other words, the Fed proved that they cannot normalize. They proved right. that they cannot raise rates. They cannot reduce the balance sheet. They cannot do what they want to do. And nor can they get inflation because they never did. So we saw that whole movie. Now, what are they doing now? So then they do it in reverse. We fell, uh, you had the Christmas Eve massacre, uh, 2018. Then the week between Christmas and New Year's, Powell gives some kind of speech. Says, eh, I guess we better stop raising rates. You know, that signaled that. He, then he said that he was he was wrong when he was a rookie about quantitative easing being being a bad thing. Well, at least lawyers look at both sides of the issue. It's good. It's, the only thing good about Jay Powell is he's not an economist. I consider PhD in economics to be a disability for actually trying to figure out what's going on in the economy. But um, so so then 2019 comes along and Powell progressively uh, lowers rates. You know, and then the pandemic, he gets back down to zero. Okay, so then a year goes by. What are they going to do? We're going to taper. And they are. In November, they'll start the taper. They'll finish it by June of uh, 2022. Uh, and then we'll get ready for the second liftoff. They're doing the same thing over, over again. again. And they, pro they already proved they can't do it. So as they proceed to do it, except one difference, the market saw what happened between 2013 and 2018. They, they, they saw, they watched the same movie the rest of us did. Yeah. So they, they <clears throat> pardon me, they're anticipating the ending. They know how this ends. So the correction will start soon. Now, just to be clear, I, the S&P is in a huge bubble, an historic bubble. That does not mean go out and short the S&P. That's a good way to lose money. I, uh, I analogize it to there's an 18 wheeler coming down the road, 80 miles an hour, it's heading over a cliff. You see the cliff, you see the truck, and you jump out and go and say, hey, stop, stop. You're good. This truck's not going to stop. You're going to get flat and you're going to get killed. So yep. shorting the S&P is a really good way to lose money today because um, bubbles, 
people say they can't see bubbles. Bubbles are easy to see. What's hard is knowing where they end, right. knowing how long they go on. So I don't want to, uh, it is a bubble. I feel confident about saying that. I don't want to say it's going to pop soon. Uh, it might be next year. It might require some other evidence. Uh, but we're starting to see that. And what Danielle described about the, uh, the yield curve flattening, that's, regardless of the absolute level of interest rates or the level of nominal rates, uh, it's the spread that counts in this case. This is called a bear flattener. So that's another sign of a recession, in addition to what the Atlanta Fed is putting out, and yep. there's a lot of other signs around the world. So uh, I would say if the perceptions here, you know, the stock market is running on a narrative. If the perception is here and the reality is here, reality always wins, but it can take time. So, yeah, I would expect to have some dry powder. Um, but uh, everything John said about cryptos is correct. I mean, it, I, I'm not a, a crypto advocate. Um, but I don't own them and I don't recommend them, but I am a crypto student. I've been doing that for 10 years, going back to the original papers. I've been doing it for a very long time. I have some views that are probably the only one in the world. But, uh, but having said that, if you like it, fine. Uh, you know, in the 60s, there was a uh, popular song called Shout, Shout, Knock Yourself Out. Sure, so yeah. if you wanna go for it, knock yourself out. Uh, I think cash, like normal cash has a role. Uh, people underestimate the embedded optionality. Um, in other words, if you have cash and things fall apart, you can pivot. If you're in uh, private equity, for example, good luck getting your money back from Henry Kravis. Right. Great, great firm, but they're not going to give you your money back. So people, they don't sell what they want. They sell what they can. Um, but if you have cash, you're the person who can look around. You can pivot quickly. You can go shopping in the wreckage. Uh, so that, that you know, basically it's not the money call on every asset class in the world. That That's valuable, and people underestimate the value of the optionality, number one. Number two, it reduces the volatility of the rest of your portfolio. So you have, if you have stock, gold, real estate, and so forth, you can sleep a little better at night. That's It's the opposite of leverage, in other words. So, um, yeah, I recommend some uh, cash, maybe a big slug, maybe 30%. Okay, great. Thank you. And I just wanted to get that sentiment out there in the room, which is while we're talking about perhaps the inevitable demise of fiat currency here, we're not necessarily talking about it tomorrow. It's not a go out tomorrow and get rid of every you know, dollar of cash that you own or euro or yen or whatnot. Um, all right. So I want to move to the probably the biggest question I think that on the, is on the audience's mind here, which is in the long run, looking at the long arc here of what we think uh, is coming and what we think that will do to the purchasing power of the world's fiat currencies. Where is a better place to store value in the long run? If you're going to be trading your fiat dollar for better stores of value over time, what are some of the ones that you guys most prefer? John, we're going to get to you last because I think I know what your answer is going to be. <laughs> Russ, why don't we start with you? I, you know, I'm, I'm a big fan of gold. I'm, I'm warming up to crypto. I'm starting to get it because uh, I think that, that... We'll get him too. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, the, the idea, I, I mean, the just go back to the earlier talk, and maybe this will help some of you out there, because, again, this is, you know, heady stuff, at least for me. But, you know, when you look at all these currencies, I look at like the like a ship on the sea, call it maybe the Titanic. And uh, you've got the water line, right? And so you've got the ship segmented with different, uh, you know, water whatever they call it, you know, like air walls, but yeah. anyway. Water type compartment. Yeah, whatever they are. So, so you got, you know, Zimbabwe and all the failed currencies. You got the dollar, the strongest currency, the world's reserve currency up at the front, right? And what happens is when, when, when the currencies start to fail, those people run in to the top of the boat and it actually creates more demand and you have a temporary raise, right? But then, then the ship is still sinking, right? All the, all the fiat currencies are failing. And so you get these dinghies on the side, like gold. And, and, and maybe crypto, diamonds, anything real that uh, Jim talks about in his oh, books, I, I, you know, I'm land. I'm advocate of carbon, yes. <laughs> Thank you. And, and, yeah, diamonds, yeah. So, so people, so people are, when you start seeing people jumping into the boats, you start seeing them looking for an escape hatch from a sinking ship. So to me, the rise of crypto is just a demonstration that the people are trying to find a way out of the system. When George did his talk this morning, which was epic, the first question out of the mouth, I was sitting there at the front table and the woman said, what do we do? And these guys came up and said, you got to get out of the system. And so liquidity, if it's not dollars, especially dollars in the bank with counterparty risk, then to, to me, it's, it's something real, something tangible. So I think gold has got to be, you know, at the top of that list. Uh, you could make the argument that energy, if you own it the right way, farmland would be something. Anything real and essential that people need, things that transcend financial markets, that transcend currencies, that transcend governments, 
if they get this great reset, the end of the day, as long as you have the right to own private property and you own something that's real and essential, you're probably going to, it, you know, you may not be a winner, but at least you won't be a, a loser. If, if everything is denominated in stuff that is passing, is, is, is temporary, like the ships that sink, and they find all the crumpled up paper that's worthless or contracts that are worthless, but they find a, tre a treasure chest of gold that still has value today. So to me, I just think anything that's real and essential and then, and then has some type of a mark, ammo, believe it or not. I mean, I found ammo to be something you can store. It retains its value, has a long shelf life, and it's, it, it divides down. You can trade around a box, a case, and as long as you're part of a community of people that are interested in that, it, it's almost like a barter commodity. So to me, that, those are the kind of things that, you know, I look at. How can I get my equity out of real estate and put it into something real, but still retain all the upside of the equity? And uh, the real estate, there's a way to do that. We're going to be talking about that. But my thing is things that are real essential that have some degree of liquidity because they serve basic human needs. All right. Excellent answer. Danielle, what would you add to that, if anything? Um, so, I, you know, I've long been ridiculed for being my age and having as huge of, a, of, a, of, a, of an exposure in my personal portfolio to municipal bonds. But, man, I'm a happy camper right now. Uh, that has been, it's, it's been an excellent place to be. The fact that the state of Illinois still exists in New Jersey and Kentucky, um, are, are they're, they're living standing proof that the United States federal government is not going to let these states go. Um, so I, so munis have been, and I think will continue to be a good store of value until the United States itself blows up. And on that note, uh, it's been fascinating to watch the appreciation of Yuan these last few months as the Chinese stock market has imploded and, and there's this controlled explosion going on administered by the CCP to, to bring the property market down because they want to shift towards domestic consumption and there's not enough money with domestic consumers because they're spending so much on housing. So the Evergrande episode, if you will, is very much intentional. Uh, and I think that that's why I keep my eye. I don't know how to play it yet, but I'll let these I'll let, I'll let these two gentlemen maybe come up with some ideas, but I think you should keep your eye on the Chinese currency, especially if the United States is going to continue down this path of profligacy, because at least since the fall of Rome, uh, reserve currency status tends to change hands uh, from country to country. And I don't suspect that that's going to change anytime soon. Great, I have here questions about the reserve currency of the future as well as China, um, but I wanna to get to the rest of the panel on this. Uh, Jim, I know you've written about this for many years of where you think better stores of value are for people looking to protect their purchasing power. Do, would you add anything to the list that's been talked about uh, so far? Yeah, I hate to state the obvious, but sometimes the obvious is not so obvious, so I don't mind. Uh, the key is diversification, and everyone says, oh, of course, diversification. And actually, there's good, you know, kind of empirical proof behind that, but the problem is people don't understand diversification. I run into people that go, oh, I'm highly diversified. I got 50 stocks in 10 different sectors. I got technology and consumer non-durables and all this. And I look at them and say, you're not diversified. You may have 50 stocks in 10 sectors, but you have one asset class. And that asset class has a conditional correlation in financial distress. They'll all go down together. Um, so real diversification, yeah, have a slice of stocks by all means. Have some land, have some real estate. Um, I like that. I recommend a big slug of cash, 30% for the reasons I mentioned. Um, have some alternatives, um, got to be very selective and some of the good funds aren't open, but there's, there's room for that. Um, a lot of my portfolio is not in publicly traded equities, it's in some technology startups, you know, risky, but I uh, find them very interesting. Um, and and uh, gold, and I, I recommend a 10% slice for gold, I recommend physical gold because if you don't have it in safe storage, you don't actually own it. Most of what people call gold is paper gold, they're ETFs, they're right. gold futures, et cetera. Um, and, you know, people love to put words in your mouth, like, Jim Rickard says, sell everything and buy gold. I've never said that. I don't think it's the end of the world, but I do think 10% is the right slice. But if you have that portfolio, 10% gold, 30% cash, you know, 10, 20% real estate, 20% equities, you know, I'm not doing the math in my head. I don't want to go past 100, but the point is that uh, that's, that's, real, that's real diversification with much lower correlation, even in distress. All right, thank you. Super helpful. I'm just curious if we were to go through uh, a fairly big market correction or, you know, the Fed were to respond to some, you know, massive reinflationary policies. Would you, do, would you see yourself changing that mix very much? Or do you feel like that's a mix that can kind of, kind of last the ages? 
Yeah, I mean, you have to be nimble. Uh, so uh, I just never said it and forget it. And that's actually part of the purpose of the cash. The time may come, we're not quite there yet, the time may come when you want to pivot from cash to 30% gold or 20% gold. Or maybe we'll get some good public policy, I doubt it, but if we did, uh, there might be a, a, a time to pivot to equities. So, but that's the beauty of cash is you can do that. And again, the embedded optionality is not well understood. Okay, great. So think of that 30% cash as something that sort of shrinks and expands based upon the opportunity set at that time. Correct. Great. All right, John, uh, I can't imagine what you're going to add to this list. Well, um, and I, I have a much heavier stock portfolio than anything else. Um, I have stocks, I have uh, VC investments, venture capital investments, and things like that. And I have probably uh, uh, it's up to about 12% now in crypto. Um, and for, for all the reasons that I've mentioned, um, and one of the one of them is, by the way, that uh, there are plenty of ways now. There are very creative people, just like on Wall Street. Um, some of them came from Wall Street. Some of them are uh, using the same technology or same uh, methods that Wall Street used. And that is, for instance, the Winklevoss twins with Gemini. They have said, in the future, no one will sell their Bitcoin. I don't know if you've heard them say that, but I have at Bitcoin Miami, they said it. And what does that mean? That means that people will borrow against their Bitcoin rather than selling it. Why? Because then, of course, you don't pay tax um, because you're borrowing against that asset. And real estate investors have been doing that forever. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. So um, why would you sell that Bitcoin and give half of it to the government, half of your gain to the government? So instead, you take a loan against your Bitcoin. Yeah, you, you don't have any more upside of that particular swath of Bitcoin that we're talking about, whether it's $100 or $10 million. Um, you would be able to borrow against it. You don't have upside on that now, but now you have a, especially if you do it in a corporation, a legitimate business deduction, the interest that you pay for that uh, loan that you've got now, and you don't have a taxable event. So now you do have all 10 million that you wanted to spend on things and so forth. Um, it's one of the reasons that down in Puerto Rico, where I am half the year, uh, you can't swing a dead cat without hitting a uh, Bitcoiner uh, as you go down San Juan. Um, and by the way, when Jim earlier was giving us all his percentages and he said, wait, I might be up over 100, that's Fed math. <laughs> Fair enough. Because the Fed's that's how the Fed counts too. Is well, am I really over 100? Yeah, it's 120 percent. Okay, <laughs> that's so. Anyway, yes. Um, I, they, 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 have, they have models to account for that. Yeah, I'm internally. Sure. Mm -hmm. I, but I'm so uh, crypto, my crypto portfolio is probably 12 percent. Stocks are probably. Um, and it'll shock Danielle, but probably like 60% Mama me. in stocks mm -hmm. right now. And uh, then I do have energy, I have property, um, and gold uh, has slipped down from, it used to be 10, now it's about 4%. And do you have mortgages on your property? Yes, sir. Yeah, so debt is something that's not a bad thing to have. Talk because about if that, you've Russ. got the, if, if the debt comes with self-services self between the tax breaks and the, and the rental income, then it becomes smaller as the currencies fail. So if you have assets like gold and other things that are going up denominated in dollars relative to the debt that is securing a, a, a valuable asset like an income producing piece of real estate, then over time that debt shrinks. Like we talked about in a pre-conference workshop as a percentage of your overall portfolio. Right now they're practically giving money away. And Danielle mentioned earlier, rents are sticky. Mm -hmm. A few years back, we came in after the financial crash and we showed the, what, you know, the, the rate of appreciation or inflation, if you will, asset value inflation in real estate, and then the crash. And then we showed the rents and the rents went down a little bit, but the values of the real estate went way down. So if you think of real estate in terms of its asset price and you know, going from cash to asset to cash, which is the way a lot of traders think, Real estate investors don't think that way. They think in terms of cash flows and long-term control of an asset uh, with debt that over time the debt becomes a smaller portion. So if I were to buy two houses side by side and those houses doubled in value in 10 years and I financed both of them, 
then one of them, the appreciation alone, would pay off the first one. And I'm in free and clear, even if I never paid down a penny of debt. And so right now, debt is something, and real estate is, the, to me, the best way to get into debt where you don't have to make the payment, and usually you're only exposed up to the collateral. So, yeah. Adam, if I could add ahead, a sure. on, to, just to shock John. Okay. Um, I'm not completely anti-equity, even though I'm really freaked out about valuations, but valuations are not timing methods. But I think that we had an interesting case study two weeks ago when we had FedEx and Nike come out and warn, and at the same time you had Costco like, hey guys, we're doing fantastic. So I think that there's gonna be something to be said, especially going into the midterm elections for, uh, for staples, for stocks with solid dividends, for stocks with great balance sheets that can weather the storm, that truly throw off cash flow, I think you're gonna have a fantastic opportunity to shrink that 30% uh, when the next time we do have a market correction comes around because a lot of these companies are very cash strong and a lot of these dividends are very secure. So look to that sector, especially do your, do your history. I'll talk more about this this afternoon. I talk more about politics today than I do about economics because it's so critical. Go back and Google 2011 between now and when I speak this afternoon and look and see what asset classes, how they performed the last time we had a debt ceiling standoff of this magnitude and staples roared. I would just add that the man to my right with 60% equities is also the world's greatest options trader. So if you, yeah. want, to be, if you want to be 60% equities, you better be as nimble as John Najarian. Exactly. Thank you, John. Uh, he flatters me. I don't deserve it. Um, but thank you very much, sir. Um, and that is one of the great things also about options, folks, um, is it's just like what Russ does. I own these stocks. I own, if you buy a, a thousand shares of Apple today, let's say it's $148 a share, give or take. Um, that's $148,000 investment. You can make 22% off of that just by selling monthly call options, which is like rent for Russ. Mm -hmm. I consider that rent when I'm selling a monthly call option um, that expires in November, for instance. I get that rent. If the stock runs up to that strike price, I buy that call back. If it happens to be that I have to pay more for the call, than I collected in the rent when I sold it. Well, I just match that up against previous uh, gains. Uh, and like I say, you average over 20% with that kind of strategy. It's just like owning an apartment and renting it out. Mm -hmm. And that's, it's pretty easy and all of you could do it. Yeah, 20% return, this market's yep. not too bad. Um, all right, guys, well, look, I'm looking at the time and wishing I had a lot more. Um, so I'm gonna go straight to some of the more firebrand questions I have here. So um, uh, by a show of hands, who thinks that the major world central banks will move to issue, uh, each issue a CBDC or central bank digital currency within the next decade? Oh, decade? Next oh. month. <laughs> yeah, it's all right, all right. As fast so, as they can. For, for, okay. Um, I guess I'd quickly love to have any, everybody just sort of quickly opine on what a world under uh, a central bank uh, CBDC would look like. And, and to John's, for John to maybe react to, um, once say the Fed has a digital dollar, a, C, a CBDC, will that look to coexist with the crypto current cryptocurrency ecosystem? Or will the Fed then say, you know what? We wanna be the only game in town. We're gonna try to, you know, tell folks that this is the only crypto that you're allowed to use? That the Fed would have, or the Treasury, or the uh, Office of the Controller of the Currency. They would all have to merge for this to happen. And, and if they did what Adam just described and said, you can't, you know, we want our digital currency, the digital dollar, to be the only one transacted could the, in the United States, could they do that? Yes, because they could have the point of sale places say it's illegal for you to take anything but a digital dollar. How'd that yeah. work out in the drug war? Yeah, <laughs> not so well. Or how about a prohibition? <laughs> not so well. If people are going to people. Yep. They just and by are. the way, China is doing this right now. Yep, China is trying to do it right now. Trying. Um, but uh, to Russ's point, you can't, uh, the only way to stop most of the cryptocurrencies out there is to shut down the internet, make the internet unavailable. Um, if you do that and, you know, Obviously, there'd be a lot of other businesses that would be out of business if you shut down the internet. Um, so you could stop point of sale and so forth, um, but it doesn't mean that people wouldn't transact in them still. 
they would find a way around it. Um, and there are many parts of the world where they've made crypto illegal and still people are using it. Right. Um, and it just trades at a premium in those areas of the world. Yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm in the Lacey Hunt school of thought that, uh, that if, we if we cross that Rubicon, um, then we're going to have bigger issues on our hands because then you're going to be effectively rendering, you know, Fed liabilities as, as legal tender. And then you get the inflation in the long run that Jim is describing. And then, you know, at that point, the, yeah. you know, the horse is out of the barn. And that's because it, it enables direct payments from the Fed to direct payments accounts, right? to individuals. We, we, we've taken it on a test run, haven't we? Stimulus checks one, two and three. And what did we get from it? The fastest inflation we've seen in our lifetimes. Uh, so, uh, you know, I, there is the, the fiscal stimulus experiment, if you will, over the past 18 months has, has told the Treasury and the Fed exactly what a Fed coin or a Fed digital dollar will look like and what it will do in terms of really jacking up inflation and keeping it up. So uh, we're, we're, we're duly warned. I was on a panel the other day with James Aldiger and a really smart guy, a nice guy, friend of mine, but he was doing the Bitcoin thing or the crypto thing, I should say, and he, he was focused on a token or coin that uh, would go up or down in value based on underlying equity prices. So basically an equity derivative, like a total return swap, uh, but um, on a forward basis, it was a um, basically an equity futures contract in digital form with a crypto wrapper. And, you know, 45 years as a securities lawyer kind of kicked in. I said, J James, isn't that an illegal stock futures? I mean, there's a reason we don't trade those in the United States because uh, they're illegal because the CFTC and the SEC can't agree. And he said, yeah, but it's cyberspace. As if, you know, somehow the fact that it's in the cloud or in the Internet, as John yeah. said, makes it legal. It doesn't make it legal. It does make it hard to catch. Uh, and more and more of these uh, exchanges are putting the physical servers and networks and, and so, uh, so forth in, you know, weird juris jurisdictions outside of the United States. But, but John's right. The U.S. does have jurisdiction. They could shut it down. But doing so is highly problematic. And the, the crypto culture seems to be catch me if you can. Yeah. Okay, um, we've got 46 seconds left. I might run a minute over, um, Brian, sorry about that. Um, but as we, as we close, two things. One, Russ, we're not gonna have enough time for me to ask you the question I was really trying I'll to- I'll do it in the to. green room. Yeah, uh, but, but um, Russ mentioned briefly earlier in the answer that uh, he has a, a model for basically using real estate as a way to basically uh, convert your gains into these tangible forms of wealth. It's called precious equity. If you guys stop him in the hall and hear his explanation of that, you should. It's a very, very valuable idea. Uh, Danielle, I want to let you close just on a conversation you and I had a couple of days ago. Uh, a lot of us tend to think about the central banks as sort of monolithic. We may think of them as a bit of a clown show, as Jim was saying earlier, but we kind of have a sense that they're all kind of lining up behind the central leader and, uh, you know, sort of like the Borg. Uh, they will just uh, monolithically decide what to do and do it. But Danielle, talking to you, it sounds like it's much more like Game of Thrones at the Fed these days. Can you just give a quick uh, answer is, to that? Uh, I mean, I, I was in the right place. I was, uh, you know, I was in the land of the Medici's. I was in the land of Machiavelli. And what is playing out at the Fed right now makes what happened when Geithner and Richard Fisher and Charlie Plosser and Jay Powell, when he's still out of spine, it makes that look like child's play. Uh, we'll talk more about it this afternoon, but what is going on inside the Fed right now is absolutely biblical. And then you have to put that in the context of the fact that they're the most powerful organization on planet Earth. So uh, it's, it, it is beyond Game of Thrones. I've never even seen Game of Thrones. I know I need to get out more. Um, or maybe that means I need to stay in more. Stay home, yeah. Right. Um, note to self. But no, it is, what's, what's going on there is I've, I've never seen a power play of this magnitude going on at the Fed. If you're not following predictit.org, pull it up and keep it up uh, in terms of who's going to be the next Fed chair. And it might be somebody, by the way, who's not even on the screen, depending on how much uglier uh, the situation becomes here in a matter of, I would say, weeks, not months, uh, given how quickly things are unfolding and how many people continue to fall. Uh, and be taken out and be and choose to be taken out as in Randy Quarles. So uh, it, it's fascinating what's going on, um, but the stakes could not be any higher because what we're talking about is central bank digital currency. And that is why there is such a battle being fought 
between the progressives and the uh, the Jay Powells of the world, the Randy Corls of the world, the Rich Claritas of the world, who want to hold the line on negative interest rates, who want to hold the line. It's not that they're dragging their feet. It's that they know central bank digital currency is a very slippery slope to socialism in America. And that's what we're seeing play out right now. And it's pretty fascinating and really ugly. How much of it is going to play out based on how much trading they've done? Well, that's so, for instance, many of these, many of the right. members of the Fed have been actively, not passively, actively, actively trading. trading I, their I, I think Daniel would say some of that information was leaked as part of, part of the, the power. I, I would say that uh, I would say that all of it has been leaked. And, and, and by the way, the person signing off on all of these financial statements for years, plural, is the one doing the leaking. So put that in your pipe. All right. Look, we're out of time. Let's have a great round of applause for this wonderful panel. Thank you. We hope you've enjoyed this animated and highly informative panel on the future of money. If you'd like to learn more about the New Orleans Investment Conference, which is where this panel took place, simply go to neworleansconference.com. I'll be there again next year, as will the experts you just saw on this panel, plus many more of the same caliber. Consider joining us there in 2022. Also, as the panelists made clear, this is an incredibly treacherous time for individual investors right now. So if you'd appreciate a free, no strings attached portfolio review by a financial advisor who can help manage your portfolio, keeping in mind the risks that the experts highlighted on this panel, just go to Wealthion.com and we'll help set one up for you. And last, please support this channel by hitting the like button and then clicking the subscribe button below as well as that little bell icon right next to it if you haven't already. Thanks so much and thanks for watching.